Hello, everybody. Um, this is our last lecture on um, uh, archaeology. Uh, and likewise, there is a reflection due. So is that not? OK. Yeah, so uh, the last lecture of archaeology, and every time we finish a section of anthropology, we're going to have a reflection. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. So you have a quiz and a reflection due at the end of this week. Um, real quickly, though, uh, next uh, section, we're going to be starting on social culture anthropology. That's my favorite. So we will be spending a little more time um, on this than, uh, sorry, on the next section than usual. Uh, hold on, give me one second. Uh, um, yeah, sorry. One of my, um, one of my fighters has got a concussion actually. So that is unfortunate. Um, I'm just checking up on, um, but anyways, yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, next week we're starting social culture anthropology as my favorite. So we're going to be doing, um, doing that for a little while. Also, there's a bunch of holidays, so uh, corresponding to the holidays, I will be assigning less work and stuff like that, okay? All right, so last thing, archaeology, settling down, we're talking about, um, you know, uh, what's it called? Social complexity in this particular lecture. All right, so what is considered complex? What is the idea flawed? Again, if we had class, I'd ask the whole class, like, what do you think constitutes a complex society? What what about a society uh, does it... What what requirements does a society need to have in order for it to be complex okay we're going to go over that in this whole lecture so social complexity is when a society has control of surplus production by a few individuals or um when it has uh social stratification or a lot of social stratification okay there's a lot of crazy words here so i'm gonna go through this slowly control of surplus production by a few individuals becomes evident Surplus production involved producing more food than bare minimum needed, right? So one of the qualifications of being a complex society is when they have extra stuff, right? I mean, it says resources, right? In this case, obviously, back back in the day, it's food. Food is the first thing, right? So now at this point, if you have enough food, so much food that everyone is fed and you're starting to have extra, that's a surplus, right? And so when a few individuals have a surplus, I just turn this light. It's nighttime. That's what is that better? Eh, well, it's fine. Um, so what it comes down to is when it is someone or a small group of people that have control over the uh, production, that is a clear indication that the society is complex. Okay. Now, how do they get there? Right. Occupational specialization. Let's talk about this first. Occupation, and if many of you, I think many of you actually probably know the meaning of this word, but it um, means something a little bit different in this context. Occupation is basically your job, right? And the reason why they don't use the word job is because occupation could mean a lot of things. A lot of times, especially in our ancient societies, we're not working for money, we're working for the group, right? So your occupation could just be like go fishing or go hunting or process these uh, berries or you know crush this, you know, make pottery, whatever, right? So that's why they use the word occupational, okay? So occupation, I'm sorry, occupational specialization means when you start to specialize in one thing. Again, in ancient, ancient, like when, you know, when we're living in bands and probably tribes as well, right? Everyone had to do everything. There's no choice. Like you, there's just too much work to be done in the community or in, in the group and everyone needs to do stuff, right? However, as your group becomes more and more developed, you will need to need to do different stuff less often, Right. In this case, basically, let's say you really like fishing. All right, we, uh, someone else could go hunt. Someone else could go process the berries. You go fish some more. And then that becomes your specialty. That becomes an occupational specialization. Does that make sense? So when you get really, when you have more time to focus on one thing or one job, if you will, okay? Contributed to social stratification. And well, as we talked about in, I think, two lectures ago, Social stratification it are basically different categories of people in a society that have different access to resources, right? So obviously, the easiest example is king, queen, uh, noblemen, knights, uh, merchants, and peasants, right? Those separate classes have different access to resources, whether it's food, money, whatever, than 
each other. Okay. So that's what social stratification is. When there's more categories of people that have different access to um, resources, right? And that is such a clear thing today, right? But our, our society, obviously all societies today are very complex where, you know, like you, if you get a degree, you have a very different amount of access to resources, meaning money, right? If you, um, if you, uh, you know, are, are, oh, if you are a student, you get certain types of benefits from FAFSA for, to get, to meet these things. You, you might, you might get SNAP benefits. You might have, um, certain types of healthcare, whatever, right? Because you're in a certain category of, in this case, of profession, you have different access to money or different access to resources, right? That changes depending on where you are in our society. And occupational specialization, I don't need to tell you about that. You know, you cannot become an anthropology professor right now because you don't have a high degree in anthropology. I can. Uh, I cannot work on the AC units because I do not have an HVAC license. Um, you know, the president of, uh, what's her name, uh, Siri, President Siri Deutsch uh, of Kingsborough cannot become a lawyer because she does not have a law degree and she is not barred, right? These are all occupational specializations, right? It's actually so obvious in our society that it's hard to explain because it's like everywhere, okay? But again, when we're talking about our ancient societies, occupational specialization was very important because it went from, you know what, everyone needs to fish, hunt, cook, process berries and make shelter. But you know what, John Doe, um, we have enough people to cover this. Why don't you just, you know, why don't you just spend all your time uh, gathering berries? And then all of a sudden, John becomes very good at gathering berries. And because he specialized at berry gathering, he gets special treatment and then leads on to different access for different people, right? Good. So common societies have Large populations, extensive division of labor, occupational specialization, and social stratification. Okay, so complex societies have large populations. That's you know that's pretty straightforward. This is a lot of people. Extensive division of labor. That just means that when they divide up the work, um, they have a lot of different criteria, right? So remember, in in the bands and tribes, it's usually or in the bands especially, it's just based off of age and sex. But as you go grow bigger and bigger into a more complex society, you have different criteria for why this job is for you, right? For whatever that criteria might be. It might be like, you know, you're really strong. And so you, I don't know, could help me move rocks or something like that. Or you have really long legs. And so you can help me swim, whatever it is. There's a different criteria for choosing um, who's doing what jobs in our uh, group, Okay. Occupational specialization, we just talked about that, job specialization, and finally social stratification. We also just talked about that, right? So these are these four are indications that a society is complex. Okay. Within social stratification, the most common uh stratification, the most common like way that people divide things up are classes, right? Rank groups within hierarchy hierarchically stratified complex societies. It's defined primarily in terms of wealth, occupation, or other economic criteria, right? And so again, the, the easy example I gave you, kings, noblemen, knights, uh, merchant, um, peasant, you know, these are all different classes that are defined, you know, primarily in wealth, right? It's just about access to, to money and wealth, but also other criteria, right? Like, you know, royal blood and stuff. Very good. So now we've talked about what makes a society complex, but let's talk a little bit about what we need to find in order for us as archaeologists to believe to know that a society is complex. Common societies leave traces of the archaeological record in the archaeological record of monumental architecture, such as temples or pyramids, elaborate burials, artifact concentrations that indicate occupational specialization, regional and re regional settlement hierarchies with, with at least three levels. Okay. So the first one is pretty straightforward right if you have monumental architecture if you literally are building a temple like or you're building a pyramid or you're building a bridge or you're building like you know something that's big and takes a lot of sophistication to create it's pretty clear that you're a socially complex society elaborate burials there's two sides to this right there's the physical side of it like again if you we, we found the pharaoh's tomb it, that would be an elaborate burial um, obviously there's a lot of stuff there. There's like the coffin is very elaborate. The, the jewels are very elaborate. The way they made the tomb itself was very elaborate, whatever, right? That's the physical part. 
but it could also be at the cultural part, right? Because if you look at a lot of cultures, what do they do with their dead? They bury them or they burn them, right? Uh, and and while the of course the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, they did a lot of elaborate stuff. A lot of people don't do elaborate things when they finish the process, right? So what is elaborate then is the cultural side of it, right? Maybe there's a big celebration of their life. Maybe they have to drink certain types of alcohol. Maybe they have to do certain types of dances or, or say certain types of poems before they pass on. Maybe they, you know, toss their ashes into a uh, lake, whatever. That is elaborate, right? That is also elaborate, okay? But even though it's not physically elaborate, it's culturally very elaborate. Artifact concentrations that indicate occupational specialization. So basically artifacts that indicate that there's job specialization. What does that look like? That means like a sharper knife. That means like a rounder bowl, a, um, you know, better knit clothing, um, you know, uh, yeah, whatever. Okay, that's what that looks like. And finally, regional sediment hierarchies with at least three levels. So this is basically going back to the social stratification part, at least three levels, right? So I'm gonna go back to the easiest example uh, with the with the pyramids. When you see the tombs of different people, they have a different amount of stuff depending on how prestigious they were, right? Obviously, a pharaoh or someone of you know in 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 the government or whatever, they have a lot of jewels, they have a lot of stuff, they have they have like cat or the, the what's it called a lot of statues near them. Very clearly, you know, royalty. Maybe a merchant might not have as big of a tomb might have less statues, has a few jewels, not too much, and a more basic coffin. And finally, maybe a peasant who has nothing there, it's just a coffin, that's it, right? That is clearly illustrative of three different um, classes. And so that would be considered uh, a complex society, right? So basically anything that indicates that there were different classes, okay? Um, obviously that last one is a little bit more difficult to see. Um, Development of comic societies. So explanations for the rise of comic societies are similar to those explaining domestication. Prime movers or single factors have been developed to explain the rise of comic societies. These are sometimes seen as applying to the rise of all comic societies across the globe. Prime movers include domestication, irrigation, population pressure, and social conflict. Okay. So domestication, um, the, so these are all, sorry. So these are all different reasons why people believe, archaeologists believe, that people uh, moved into being a complex society, right? Domestication is one of the big ones, right? Domestication, which is, again, the control of reproduction uh, of plants, of certain plants and animals, um, that supposedly gave people free time to invent complex social rules, right? So basically everyone was fed or everyone didn't have to hunt and stuff as much. Sorry, I shouldn't say didn't have to. They didn't have to hunt and a fish and gather as much. And so that gave them extra time to develop more complex social rules. That is one theory as to how complex societies came about. Irrigation. Uh, irrigation is bringing water to a dry place, right? So irrigation needs in dry areas that, that require a complex bureaucracy to develop and manage complex canal systems. So what people believe is like, oh, maybe they needed water, right? And in order to get the water to where they were, they had to think and and work together in certain ways that created a complex society. That's what another theory. The third theory, population pressure. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, growing population led to the rise of leaders to manage populations and social conflict within societies, right? So those two are the same, right? So population pressure, social conflict, those two are kind of the same, right? You kind of have to like, you know, uh, so I guess for population pressure, you can think of like, oh, we have a lot of extra corn. What do we do with the corn? We can't just give it to everybody, right? So you got to manage that stuff, okay? That's population pressure. That's, that's sorry, that's one of the theories as to why, um, you know, people, um, yeah, people just like end up becoming complex. The last one, social conflict in society. This is, this is a funny one. Um, when there's conflict within society and it's a big society, things go bad pretty quickly, right? Now, um, I, I'm sure many of you have gotten mad enough, right? Whereas when someone, I don't know, what's something like, like, let's say you're eating lunch and someone knocks the lunch out of your hand on purpose and they like start laughing at you, you know, you're, you're going to want to kill them, right? You're going to want to kill that person. You want to stab them. Okay. So now that's obviously not the case. You're not, probably not going to do that because you know that the penalty of that is, you know, you're going to go to prison or jail or whatever. Um, however, uh, in a society that's developing, 
Um, and there's, there's social conflicts such as I'm growing tomatoes and this dude just stole mad tomatoes. You know, you're going to want to freaking poke him in the eye with a freaking, you know, with a stick or something. But that's not the right way to solve the problem, because if you keep on doing that with a large society, you can't, you know, it's just not going to work out. Right. And so this was another theory as to why um, people became complex. OK, so the problem with these theories, even though they are valuable to learn, obviously, that's why I'm talking about them, is that they're unicausal, meaning that they they focus on like one thing. But in reality, as most of us understand, you know, decisions that we make are it's a multiplicity of things. Right. When you go out to eat, let's say, do you think about, oh, is it is this food good? That's one of the things you think about, but you also think about, is this convenient on the way to, uh, from, from, from work? Is this convenient on the way back from school? Is this something that my uh, girlfriend or boyfriend or partner would like? Is this something that would uh, cost too much? There's a lot of things that you think about when you're just going out to eat, you know, dinner or lunch or whatever. So if we're talking about the development of complex societies, it's very clear that it needs to be more than just one reason. So Robert Canero's theory is multi-causal and consists of environmental circumscription, which uh, is basically there's not a lot of new land for people to use, population pressure, which caused stress on the lands available, and then finally warfare arose as conflict between neighboring village increase, right? When operating together, these factors led to the rise of state, okay? So <clears throat> in Robert Canero's theory, these three things are the main causes, but more importantly, it's multiple things happening with each other, right? Because people are staying still, not a lot of new land to, to use. Because people are staying still and probably domesticating yeah, more food, more people, that means that in that area, there's going to be less food for you to use or for, for you to eat. And finally, because of that, people will, will fight each other. And then that's what Robert Canero believed motivated people into complex societies. So no single factor explains the rise of all com early common societies. Written records provide clues, but are not found in all early common societies. Early common societies were unstable. Periods of political unity alternated with lows lacking political in integration. This gave a complicated understanding of the complex societies, right? So yes, while many of old societies do have a writing system, a lot of them don't. And it doesn't mean that they're complex. That, sorry, it doesn't mean that they're not complex, but what it does mean is that it's very difficult for archaeologists to know like what actually went down in that society. So um, real quickly, I have a great example here, um, or two examples, sorry. Early foragers along South America's Indian coast had money about the Arctic for irrigation and agriculture. The Inca Empire rose in the late AD 1400s and built on earlier complex societies. The Inca Empire had monumental architecture, split inheritance system, complex road network, but lacked writing. Based off of those criteria, okay, it is clear that uh, the Inca Empire was a complex society, right? And in fact, they were such a they were such a strong society that the empire fell in 1525 following Spanish conquest and the Inca Civil War. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the Spanish were only able to overcome the Inca because they were having a war within themselves to begin with. If the Spanish were fighting the Inca like straight up, it, it, they would not have won. Right. Um, but the main point of this slide is to just to tell you the Inca was a very complex society, but they did not have a system of writing. Right. They had all this stuff they didn't have a system of writing. So writing is not necessarily the most important thing when it comes to defining a complex society. So full circle. Wow, that was a short one. That's okay. Uh full circle, right? What is considered complex? There's a whole bunch of things, but the main things are right here, right? Monumental architecture, elaborate burials, artifact concentrations that indicate occupational specialization, and regional settlement hierarchies at least three levels, right? That is kind of the, the, the for archaeologists, that's the most important uh, four factors that indicates to us that they're complex, right? But why is this idea flawed? So the reason why this is flawed is because we're using this word complex to define stuff and to have a certain understanding of our, of our societies. But in reality, like, again, remember, humans don't develop on a straight line. And the Inca Empire is a great example, right? They were a very complex society, but they didn't have a system of writing. Right. Uh, the example from the previous lecture, I think it was in the, the Natufians. They had a they had a system of what did they have? Was it a hair inheritance system? I forgot what they had, but anyway, they had some kind of system, right? But they didn't even know how to domesticate, right? So even though we kind of had these guidelines as to what a complex society might be, just remember that these guidelines are guidelines that are created by us. 
they aren't necessary. They're, they're used as a learning tool or a teaching tool or understanding tool. They aren't necessarily the most accurate depictions of what happened or sorry, they aren't necessarily like the absolute truth when it comes to understanding how our societies develop. Remember, we're humans. The way you go through life is very different from the way that I went through life. So it's no surprise that a, a society that lives, you know, in, uh, you know, the Brooklyn area back then, the Brooklyn area and a society that lives in the Queens area will have different ways of living their lives. Okay, we have to keep that in, man, in mind. Uh, and more importantly, different ways of becoming complex societies. Okay. Um, yeah, that's it. So, wow, that was quick. So uh, remember, reflection uh, three is due at the end of this week. Remember, sorry, not three. Reflection two is due at the end of this week. Um, uh, quiz three is due at the end of this week. And um, yeah, after this, we'll be starting on social culture anthropology. All right. Uh, yeah, as always, if you have any questions, just shoot me an email at raymond.fong at kbcc.cuny.edu.